our last table, last presentation. And you have you have the honor to receive here Professor Sharon Davis. I will introduce her. Let me find here. Professor Sharon Davis is the president and CEO of the Catherine Foundation. Dave's career experience span both academic and no academic fields. From 2017 to 2021, Dave, Dave was provost and senior vice president for academic affairs at Spelman College. She joined uh, Spelman from the Ohio State University, where she was vice provost for diversity and inclusion and chief diversity officer. Davis was also a member of OSU Mords College of Law Faculty from two, uh, 22 years, serving as the Gregory Williams Chair in Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. In addition, Davis directed the university's Kirwan Institute for the Studies of Race and Ethnicity and Interdisciplinary Engaged Research Institute, known nationally for its works in social justice, equity, and inclusion. She also held an appointment to the Ohio Ad Ad Advisory Com Committee to the United States Commission on Civil Rights. There is a lot of information uh, about Professor uh, Dave, she has a very impressive curricula, and it's almost impossible <laughs> to say everything you have done in your in your career. So for us, it's very very important. It's a great honor to have you here to talk about affirmative action in universities. So yeah, feel very welcome here at the Institute of Advanced Studies, and uh, I am very very. Happy to have you here. Please feel comfortable to speak what you want to about your fields. So is this on? Everybody here? Okay. Well, thank you so much, Professor Gesolene, for that beautiful introduction. I, I truly appreciate it. And it's a privilege to be here with uh, everybody. Um, good uh, kudos to you for hanging in here this late in the day after uh, hours and hours of, of listening to people up on, the, on this stage. I have the uh, misfortune of being uh, the last speaker of the day so, so late, uh, and I'm sure you're, you all are tired. So I'm going to try to move through some slides that I put together for you um, as quickly as possible without uh, being uh, uh, unfair to our translators in the, in the back who are trying to keep up. Uh, so let's see if I can do both of those at the same time. Uh, I was asked to talk about affirmative action in the United States uh, because you all are so focused on uh, affirmative action here in Brazil. Uh, and there's a lot to say about affirmative action in the United States because it has a long history. And most of that history, quite frankly, has been about the battle against affirmative action in the United States. And I'm going to show you um, a, a glimpse of that history uh, with these slides. So the first thing uh, we should uh, understand is what affirmative action uh, actually is in higher education, which I'll focus on. It's also You could also have affirmative action in the workplace. But I'm going to focus on affirmative action in college admissions in, in, in higher education. And essentially, it was the effort to increase uh, the opportunities for underrepresented minorities, in particular for African Americans, um, in the you know, late 1960s, beginning of the 1970s, um, to admit them into college campuses, universities. 
Um, I, I want to tell you also that when I speak, I rarely use the word affirmative action. Uh, and the reason for that is because affirmative action has been co-opted by uh, critics of it, detractors of it, uh, enemies of it, very, very successfully in the United States. So if you hear the word affirmative action, most people will have a negative reaction to that in the United States. And as a result of that, I tend to use words like race conscious or race aware admissions practices. It's a longer way of, uh, of talking about uh, what we're talking about, but I do it very intentionally because of the success of the critics of affirmative action to, to link it in the minds with something that is not good. Specifically, um, critics of affirmative action have said from the very beginning uh, that affirmative action is unfair. Uh, it's unfair because it's essentially a racial preference that prefers one race over another race. It uh, discriminates on the basis of race against one race for the advantage of another race. And that we shouldn't do that, and instead, we should adhere to a principle of color blindness. No one's race should be noticed under this way of thinking. And that, that, that mindset really has been quite successful in the United States in, in turning um, the uh, many in the public against the use of what's referred to as re affirmative action. And we'll see um, how that came about. I will focus primarily on a long line of lawsuits that were brought against universities in the United States that instituted race conscious admissions practices, that adopted those practices, which essentially was looking at the race of applicants when deciding who to admit into a college class, an entering class. Um, with the with the goal of those opportunities, creating opportunities for folks who previously had been excluded from those universities, and also uh, to create diverse student bodies that would benefit all of the students because of the educational benefits that flow from diversity. This is a cartoon that uh, that one artist came up with saying, uh, using this word preferential treatment, which is essentially saying, you know, how does it to a person, uh, an, a, a non-white person, how does it feel to get preferential treatment just because of the color of your skin? The history that uh, Professor Ed just took us through, that hundreds of years of history of racial oppression is uh, is dismissed by folks who do engage in actually this myth of a racial um, democracy, and uh, and instead uh, the this young person is telling is saying back, you tell me because the truth is when you look at that history, it's hard to to uh, conclude anything but that the uh, preferential treatment on the basis of race in, throughout the history of the United States has not been in the favor of black people. Uh, it has been uh, the opposite. Um, yet, I'm going to start, go back to uh, this young person at the time. He's no longer young. His name was Alan Bakke. He brought the first lawsuit against the use of race in college admissions in 1978. And I point out 1978 for a reason, because where Ed Dorn just left off was the late 1960s, when all of that legislation had just been passed. Very quickly, lawsuits were beginning to be brought in the next decade against universities that decided to do something to try to increase the numbers of black and brown people on their campus. So it's significant that this happens right away 
That's how little tolerance uh, many people in the United States had for the idea of creating some way for black and brown students to be welcomed onto campuses that they were previously excluded from. Alan Bakke wanted to go to medical school at the University of California in, in Davis. And he applied not once, but twice. And he was not admitted. And he believed that the reason he did not get in was because of the decision of the medical school to reserve 16 of its 100 seats in its entering class for minorities. And he thought that his, his, his MCAT um, test scores were likely to be better than a number of those um, applicants who, who took those 16 of 100 seats. And he thought that was unfair to himself. He called it reverse discrimination. So this case went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. It was very controversial. There were people on both sides arguing, um, either uh, on the side of Alan Bakke and uh, on the side of affirmative action uh, in higher education. Uh, and when it got to the Supreme Court, this is another cartoon that basically is, summarizes the argument that uh, uh, Alan Bakke was making, and that is uh, affirmative action is weighing in favor of this young black person on the seesaw, but they completely uh, ignore all of the other things that have been to the benefit of, of uh, non-black people that continued to weigh in their, their favor. When the United States Supreme Court got the case, it became evident right away that the court was greatly divided on what the right answer should be about the constitutionality of affirmative action. And they split right down the middle. There are nine justices on the United States Supreme Court. Four of them said race cannot constitutionally be looked at when making decisions about uh, whether to admit someone to a, a college uh, campus. Another four thought that race could constitutionally be looked at given the history of exclusion in, on our, our uh, college campuses and also um, an effort to, uh, to provide true equal opportunities for, for black people. Um, it, uh, four justices thought it was not fair to, to expect that uh, black uh, and brown uh, applicants would be able to compete um, equally without, uh, without some means of uh, looking at the other values that they brought to a college campus. Uh, the controlling vote in the case was Justice Powell. And he really sided mostly with the four justices that didn't like the use of race uh, in college ad admissions. Uh, he he uh, emphasized uh, that any time race is used uh, for, uh, by a public institution, it had to be strictly scrutinized. And it would be uh, found to be unconstitutional if it wasn't narrowly tailored to some uh, appropriate state concern. Uh, and he struggled, but he, he concluded that it was appropriate for a state institution, a state university, to be concerned about the lack of diversity on its campus. Uh, but he wasn't convinced that the way that the University of California went about that was sufficiently narrowly tailored to address that. And so he ruled in favor of Alan Bakke. And he said that the, the university had to admit him. They had denied him a, constitutional, uh, a constitutionally pr uh, defensible process. Uh, and so he won. But Justice Powell also said that he could imagine a program of admissions that would pass constitutional muster. 
and that uh, it would look more like the, the admissions program that existed at Harvard University at that time. Uh, so he clarified that there were certain things that would make an admissions program unconstitutional, but there were other things that might make it constitutional. Uh, to the, the problems uh, that he saw with the University of California was that it established a quota system. Quota in the United States is not something that you want to create. I, I notice that you use the word a lot um, here in Brazil, but in the United States that would make what the university was doing unconstitutional. They, you would not want to deny um, a non-minority like Alan Bakke individualized consideration. So you would have to be able to prove that you really looked at uh, his application as an individual and you looked at other people's applications as individuals, not just a member of a group, in this case a racial group. Uh, and, uh, and so Justice Powell thought uh, fixing a certain number of seats and setting them aside uh, for uh, the, the benefit of just minority students was unconstitutional. Setting a separate track for minority students to compete against each other for those seats was unconstitutional because it didn't allow Alan Bakke, a white applicant, to also uh, compete for those, those seats. But he also said that creating meaningful diversity on a college campus was a legitimate concern for a state and that if it went about that in a different way, uh, if it looked at uh, each one of those applicants holistically, it might be possible to say that race could be one of many factors that you looked at of, of all of those applicants that, that could be used in, in their favor. So Alan Bakke himself won that case, but so did race-conscious admissions practices. And what universities did after this case was decided um, was that they patterned their admissions practices on the basis of what Justice Powell said in, in that case. And that, uh, that meant that uh, we were able to look at race as one of many factors. So did that do it? Was the argument over? Not even close. That was 1978. In 1996, the state of Texas went rogue, uh, which, which essentially means they decided that they were going to read what had happened in the Bakke decision differently from the way that the rest of the country was reading that case. And they were going to say that there was actually no binding decision reached in that case. Remember I said it was split right down the middle, four, four, and then one justice in between. And Texas federal court decided in 1996 that that meant that that wasn't a binding holding on them. They were free to decide for themselves whether or not uh, it, uh, race should be used uh, in, uh, under the Constitution in uh, the state of Texas. And they held that the use of race in university ad admissions at the University of Texas and other, uh, other universities in the state was unconstitutional. So they, uh, they went their own way in Texas, as, they, as Texas often does. The question was, what was going to happen next? The United States Supreme Court did not take up that case. Uh, and, uh, and so the rest of the country waited to watch to see what would happen if you couldn't consider race in college admissions directly. And what happened was very dramatic. Black enrollment at the University of Texas Law School dropped by more than 90%. They, there, there were only 38 black students in the entering class at the law school to begin with. The preceding year, before that Hopwood case was decided, it dropped to four after the, the case was decided. Uh, Mexican-American enrollment dropped nearly 60% at, 
after the court decided that case in the way in which it, it, it did. And for years after that, the University of Texas had a very hard time uh, to, to create diversity without being able to look directly at race. So what happened uh, was that the University of Texas was very concerned about that. Other, other universities around the country rejected that reading of the Bakke case. Uh, and lawmakers were under pressure to do something to enable the university to have some diversity on, on its campus if it wasn't able to look directly at an, an applicant's race. And what they did was they came up with what's called a percent plan. A number of, st of states now have this. Uh, in this case, it was a top 10% plan. What it meant was um, all of the high school seniors who were looking forward to college, if they graduated in the top 10% of their graduating class, they would automatically be guaranteed a seat in a Texas public university. Uh, and, uh, and the reason why that would work to create diversity without revealing the individual race of an applicant is because the high schools in the state of Texas were highly segregated by race. We had not succeeded in creating um, integrated uh, public high schools. And so they knew that there were a certain number of high schools in the state of Texas that were essentially all black or heavily Hispanic. And if they took the top 10% off of, the t uh, of, of those classes and gave them the right to attend a university in Texas, then they would be able to create some diversity in that way. And it did improve the situation uh, for um, some campuses, uh, but it raised other questions. The first question is, is that really race neutral? When you know that the reason why this works is because you have highly segregated high schools by, by race. People you know, give different answers to that, but Ruth Bader Ginsburg came up earlier in the conversation, and she said only an ostrich could regard a percent plan as race unconscious. You're very conscious of, of the race of the students in those high schools when you made that law. But as to whether or not they work to create diverse colleges, it really depends on the demography of the state that you're talking about. It wouldn't work in a lot of states. There's states like Maine and other states that are largely white states. And if you want to create diverse college campus experiences for your students in those states, it wouldn't work to take the top 10% of the, the graduating high school seniors. You'd have to look beyond that. Um, and, uh, and also, it wouldn't work for uh, graduate admissions or professional school admissions because you can't just take the top 10% of college graduates and expect that you're going to create diversity in your, uh, in your uh, professional or graduate programs. Um, and even in Texas, it was discovered that while it increased uh, the numbers of minority students, it never got them back to close to pre-Hopwood sta standards. And so mostly the, 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 the research suggested that this didn't do the job of creating diverse campuses. So was the argument over? Not even close. The next lawsuit that was brought was brought in 2003. It was brought against the University of Michigan. Uh, uh, Bollinger was the president of the University of Michigan at the, at the time. Two people sued the University of Michigan at the same time. One was Barbara Gruder, who is pictured here. Another was Barbara Gratz. Uh, Barbara Gratz sued the undergraduate program Barbara Gruder sued the law school um, admissions program. Both of them sued because each one of those programs looked at the race of applicants. Um, using a very, very holistic approach, 
not with, uh, with quotas, or at least the law school did. The, the, these cases went two different ways. Uh, the, the law school won its lawsuit. The undergraduate program lost. And that was because the undergraduate program actually gave a certain number of points to minority applicants. The, the court thought that that was too mechanical, not individualized uh, consideration, but in much more nuanced, um, holistic approach used by the law school um, that was more in line with what Justice Powell said in, in the Bakke case, was uh, was good enough. Justice O'Connor, Sandra Day O'Connor, was the deciding vote in that case. She really wasn't a fan of race conscious admissions practices, uh, and she hoped that in another 25 years, universities in the country should be able to come up with race neutral ways of creating diversity on their campuses. So she said it for about 25 years in, in the future. That would bring us to 2028. She, she hoped for that by then it would no longer be necessary to look at race directly, but she concluded that it was still uh, at the time of this case. The requirements um, of constitutionality really remained largely the same. They had to be narrowly tailored to the need, uh, holistic, not automatic, no quotas, no set points given to black students, Latino students, but it would enable universities and professional schools to enroll a critical mass of minority students in order to attain the educational benefits of diversity. Was the argument over after, after Gruder and Gratz? Not even close. Uh, the next case that was brought uh, was brought in the early, uh, was brought in, in the 2000s. Abigail Fisher against uh, the University of Texas. So once again, the University of Texas uh, was arguing uh, that, um, that this young woman, Abigail Fisher, um, she'd have got her dream come true. She always wanted to go to the University of Texas. Her brother had attended there. Her uncle had attended there. She wanted to be a Longhorn too, and uh, and she she was she believed that the only reason that she was not admitted was because of her race and that black and brown students with with lower test scores were being admitted when one of those seats should have gone to her. And so she sued the university. This is uh, what one cartoonist uh, thinks of that kind of argument, uh, because it always seemed to be the minority that, that uh, was to blame for uh, students like Abigail Fisher not getting into the university. It wasn't the, the students who were admitted because they had a parent who had gone there and they were the, the daughter or son of an alum or the son of a big donor or a, a talented athlete or a person who lived in a different state who was coming in for di geographic diversity. It always seemed to be the black and brown students who were to blame. And that's what this cartoonist is capturing. Fisher case went back to the United States Court, Supreme Court not once but twice. Uh, and Justice Kennedy was the, the justice who had the controlling vote in that case. This case was a big surprise to a lot of folks because Justice Kennedy had dissented in the Grutter case. He thought that the University of Michigan should have lost that case instead of won it. Uh, he disagreed with Justice O'Connor. But by the time he was the controlling vote in the Fisher case, the second one, he was prepared to agree that it was a compelling state interest to seek to create diverse college campuses in order to diminish racial stereotypes, to promote cross-racial understanding, to prepare students for living effectively and leading in a diverse world, to cultivate leaders who, with legitimacy because um, uh, they, they reflect the, the population of the, of the country. 
but, but he had to be convinced that the University of Texas had narrowly tailored the way that it went about it and was not um, engaged in an automatic, mechanized um, uh, approach. He finally was convinced of, of that, and he ruled in favor of the university. Was the argument over? Not even close. That brings us up to today, actually, in another case that is currently pending before the United States Supreme Court right now. Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard and versus the University of North Carolina. Let me tell you a, a little thing, uh, a couple of things that are different about this case, these cases. One is that one of the cases is against Harvard University, which is a private university. Um, the, the second is you might notice there's not a name of a particular individual bringing this lawsuit instead of Alan Bakke or Cheryl Hopwood or Abigail Fisher or Barbara Bruder. It's Students for Fair Admissions. This is just a made-up group, essentially. And it's, but it is a, it's an interesting made-up group because it's a group of um, Asian American um, applicants who um, have been who had been identified who wanted to go to Harvard or who wanted to go to the University of North Carolina, but they didn't get in. And they then were arguing that the reason that they did not get in was because of the race of black students and Latino students was being used in their favor and against Asian American applicants and white applicants. And so it's essentially the same argument, but it, it is utilizing a different minority group to uh, make uh, a, a stronger uh, argument. But another thing that is, is very important about this case is it's actually not arguing uh, that the standard that was set in Baki was not satisfied. It's arguing that the case of the decision of the Grutter case should actually be overruled altogether. And what the court should do is to hold that race can never be considered in college admissions. This case is going to be argued this October um, when this court comes back into recess. And it will be argued at the very end of October. And I can tell you on the basis of my experience that this case is not likely to be decided before June of 2023. Uh, right before the court goes out of recess, that's its pattern, is it saves its most controversial decisions for, for decision right before they go out. And so look for this, uh, because this is going to be a, a very important decision of a, um, a, a, the Supreme Court. The, I, and I'm going to do something right now that I, I rarely do as a trained lawyer, and that is to predict the outcome of this case uh, and, and to tell you why I'm predicting it in the way in which I am. And that is that you can see from this long line of lawsuits that the, the battle between views um, about the constitutionality of uh, affirmative action or race-conscious admissions practices has never stopped, not from the moment that it was created in, uh, in the United States. And so... Uh, some people think of it as reverse discrimination or racism, and other people think of it as the only effective means of creating um, racial diversity and other diversity on our, on our campuses. Uh, I will say that um, my major takeaways from all of those cases uh, is that this has been relentless, a battle, and there's no reason to think that it will even be over after the next case is decided. It is, it is uh, the same issue that has come, it's come back before the United States Supreme Court more than any other issue. The court has always been closely divided 
on what is the right answer. And, and the way that it comes out this time may actually expose that our current United States Supreme Court is more of a political institution than it has been in the past, and that's bad news. My prediction is that we will lose the argument um, for race-conscious admissions practice um, this next term, and that it will go against both Harvard University and the University of North Carolina. I am I'm predicting uh, that it will come out with three justices on one side and six justices on the other, the conservative justices lined up against uh, affirmative action. Uh, the Chief Justice uh, Roberts, Justice Alito, Thomas, Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, and Coney Barrett. Um, Ed, Ed uh, Dorn talked about uh, some of these uh, Supreme Court uh, appointments, and the last three uh, were appointments by President Donald Trump, and I think he was very focused on this and, and the abortion case when deciding who to put on the Supreme Court. Another reason why I predict that this case will come out against those universities is because during the oral arguments in the Fisher case, uh, the Uni University of Texas case, the Chief Justice asked uh, a, a lawyer for, uh, for the university, what unique perspective does a minority student add to a physics class? And if you can, if you can hear that kind of question being asked by the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, you can hear the dismissiveness um, uh, of, of the, the justice um, when it comes to this idea um, about diverse uh, campuses. Another, uh, another justice, um, who, who died, Justice Scalia, also said in open court that he thought that black students might be uh, mismatched with the universities, these selective universities, and that they should actually go and attend a school that was um, less challenging to, to them uh, and that's a theory that some people have um, about why we should not have race-conscious admissions practices um, to begin with. So all of this comes down to the question of merit. Who has merit? How do we assess who has merit? It, the current way of, of assessing all of these, these uh, decisions um, revolve around test scores, essentially. This is where uh, these... Uh, these applicants uh, are uh, making their claim. Uh, they're basing it on higher test scores um, versus uh, the test scores of, of black and brown students. And the argument uh, against that is that test scores aren't the only good reason for making a decision about who should be admitted into an entering college class. Uh, but this is, this is what has enabled this to happen. Um, the, even if you, you thought about it that way, this cartoonist is trying to point out that those test scores are more connected, research shows, to how well off your family is than it is anything else. And that some students have had to get over all kinds of hurdles and, and, and difficulties in life while getting to where they are, um, while others have a much easier way. So uh, this cartoonist is, is, is saying, quit your whining. It's the same distance. We you both need to, to get across that line. Whoever makes it there first, you know, it's the winner and should, should, should get uh, rewarded that way. Uh, but of course, that's, uh, that ignores a lot of uh, important things about applicants' lives um, that can't be encapsulated in a single test score uh, for performance on a particular day, uh, including the fact that there are all kinds of advantages that the, the students with the highest test scores are likely to have had in their life, um, including tutors, SAT coaches, ADD specialists, and, and so on. 
all of those things somehow are not a part of the, the process of thinking about who has merit. I think we're not going to be able to avoid that question of who has more merit in the future. Because if I'm right, and you guys can all write to me and tell me um, I was wrong uh, with my prediction about this, this case. I hope that I am wrong. But I think that I am right. And this, this is going to be a decision that will come out in June of 2023. That gives us a very short period of time to figure out how can we create um, rich, robust diversity on college campuses if we're prevented from looking at the race of the applicants directly. Uh, and so there are some, some answers to, to that. And in response to, to an earlier question about states versus all of what I focused on, which has been federal law, US constitutional law, the Civil Rights Act of uh, the Federal Civil Rights Act. Uh, but in a number of, of states, the public is so opposed to affirmative action that they've already um, passed uh, uh, other state laws, essentially, that ban the use of race in college admissions. So some states are already um, uh, under, uh, under the, the um, force of state laws that make it unconstitutional. That may be a part of the Supreme Court's decision in, in, this, in this case as, as well. So, so if that is the case, then you will see within a year's time uh, the universities having to be creative about how to create diversity. They have to do it. In the United States, in the 21st century, they must create diversity without looking at race if the court decides this case in, the, in that way. And uh, the reason why that they have to do it is because of the realities of the shifting demographics of, of, our, uh, of our nation's population. As, as Ed said earlier, by mid-century, the United States will be a majority-minority nation. Already, we are approaching that point when it comes to college-age students. We will be at that point in 2025. So we're very close to the point where the majority of college applicants will be minority students. And if these campuses continue to look the way that they do now, that's really the picture of um, an apartheid system of admissions. So, so university presidents are going to be under enormous pressure to come up with a different way of answering that question about merit. Who has merit and why? And that is work that the Kettering Foundation wants to be involved with over the next year as we prepare ourselves for this, uh, this maybe final blow to affirmative action in college admissions in the United States. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Professor Davis, for your wonderful speech and very important to us here at USP in Brazil in this time. So it's very important to listen about that because I believe you have to face that kind of situation here this year and forward. And now I want to know, quero saber se alguém tem alguma questão? Professor Alessandro? Okay, well, during this day, we have an opportunity to reflections, and we have a, a good speech about um, these uh, themes, diversity, mental health, affirmative actions, and I would like to propose that Catherine Foundation, Professor Maxim and Professor Sharon, thinking about and we have condition to transcript all this uh, speech because it was um, recorded. And thinking about, 
I know that um, Catherine Foundation has an annual periodical which call High Education Exchange, right? So thinking about maybe we can um, collect all this information and discussion during this day, transcript the record in English, and offer a conduit of tests, tests, right, speech to publishing in this high education exchange. Okay, just thinking about, and we ask if you have this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Somewhere, alguém mais? Tem alguma questão? Comentários? Professora Thelma, professor Thelma. Thank you so much. <laughs> It was very enriching. Uh, I learned a lot. <laughs> um, my question is, I was thinking while you were talking, how important it is in this electoral process that we're going through to think about who wins, because that will impact on our Supreme Court composition. And I think we're missing that part in our conversations about who should be elected because that will change fundamentally beyond the four-year mandate, um, our history, our, our, our rights. So I would like to hear, maybe if you have any comments about that, how elections and, and uh, the composition of the Supreme Court and the impact of that on our rights. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's a very important question, and there are a couple of things. The first thing I have to say as the president of the Kettering Foundation is that we are a nonpartisan um, organization, and so I cannot take a position on uh, any any partisan issue. Uh, but uh, that said, one of the things about democracy is that uh, it's there are, are things that sometimes referred to as the soft guardrails of democracy, things that we need in order to make sure that our democracy is sustainable, is preserved. And it's something that we've, we've been talking about and hearing about today as it is, um, it is a system of governance that has to be defended. And one of the mechanisms of defense is a balance of power in the United States. We, we balance... Um, the, po the power of our, our federal government um, with, between three branches, the judiciary, the executive, and the legislature. Uh, but what has happened most recently with some of the appointments to the United States Supreme Court is it's affecting the perception of the court and its impartiality and its intention to be a check against the overreaching of other branches. And so when I said that, that uh, what's at jeopardy here for the United States Supreme Court right now, both after the, the, the abortion decision and this coming decision on affirmative action, is the, the, the Supreme Court is at risk of becoming seen as a political organization and not the impartial arbiter of constitutional questions. And so that's dangerous to democracy. Uh, and, uh, I, and I can say that without uh, making any kind of partisan. Uh, and so I do think that it is important for, um, for all presidents, no matter what party they, have to, they, they are a part of, to choose people not, for, uh, their, their, not because they can pass a certain litmus test that these uh, the president wants, but because they think that they can be fair and uh, uh, neutral arbiters of constitutional questions. I do think that there's reason to question whether or not some recent um, uh, appointees to the United States Supreme Court um, have been done in, in that way, and that is a problem for democracy. Uh, do you want to ask something? Yes. Uh, 
Boa tarde, professor. Good afternoon, professor. Good afternoon, professor. There is a difference <coughs> in the debate between affirmative action policies uh, regarding the racial policy. The black population in the U.S. is 12 to 13 per percent. I believe that the denomination quota is not good in Brazil. What is there in uh, in common and different uh, regarding this policy? Yeah, um, and I'm I'm not sure I can do the the Brazilian policy justice because. I, I would have to know a lot more about the way in which it functions. But, but I, uh, your, your point about, so the black population in the United States is significantly smaller. Uh, and that, that's true for, for us uh, thinking about uh, black African Americans nationally. In some states, the, 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 Portion of the state population for African Americans is significantly higher than that. Uh, and if you think about African Americans and Latino Americans, then, uh, then that is a much larger group uh, of uh, citizens who both are struggling to have their presence on university campuses reflected, reflecting the, their proportions in. in the, um, the either the state or the national uh, population. So uh, yeah, and and very soon, I mean, we can't avoid these these questions uh, in the United States because of the rapid shifting demographics of, of the country, uh, and uh, and you know, and that is true both, by the way, for um, the Asian American. Uh, Population, which is one of the fastest growing population groups in the in the United States right now, and also uh, a the fastest growing population group, which is a biracial, multiracial group, a new group uh, in the United States. So, so we are in unexplored territory in some ways uh, in in the United States, and we have to think about. How do our campuses reflect all of the richness of that diversity um, wherever it, it exists? Um, unfortunately, right now, I don't think that there's not a single uni major university, selective university in the, in the country that could claim that there are a critical mass of underrepresented minority students on their, on their campuses, even with race conscious admissions practices in, in place. And so, so we've got a lo long way to go and a lot of pro progress to, to make. Um, and, and with respect to the, the way that um, uh, it is done, uh, affirmative action is done here, I'd have to know a lot more about the details of that to be able to answer it, unfortunately. Okay, uh, I believe the question Professor Juarez is raised is because here in Brazil, the majority of population is already black and uh, university don't reflect this. So the question is maybe in 10 years or more than that, if you don't have a kind of policy like quotas, quotas here, uh, it's not possible to diverse campus or university because you are living in a kind of segregation. I, I believe it's different from the U.S. Yeah. Uh, one example is uh, here in Brazil now, the Supreme Court approved to use race uh, as a criterion to select people to get in universities. And the argument that um, white supremacists use to avoid that is you're not, it's not possible to say who is black or who is is white in Brazil because of the miscegenation. So is that a different way to do with that kind of situation here in Brazil? So until now, the Supreme Court approved race as a criterion. I don't know about the next year or other years. Well, that's, you know, it's very interesting because essentially what it means is that 
your universities are not reflective of the, the population right now. Neither are ours. I mean, if they were, this uh, this argument would be over, right? I mean, they our campuses would have 12 to 15 percent African American students. They would have a much larger uh, group of Latino students than that, and then they would continue to shift. But the court has made it clear that racial balance is not the goal, and it's never been challenged on the rightness of that that assertion. Uh, it is. It has been an assertion, but it hasn't really been challenged directly. And so, so I think that's where the the challenge has to be, both here in Brazil and in in the United States, is raising the question of, well, why is that? I mean, some years ago, women were were not present on our campuses either. Women are, are essentially fifty percent of our population, slightly more. And there was a, a long time before the 1970s when that, when that was uh, the case. But through the 70s, women started to give, grow in, in numbers until they actually reached parity. And now they are. There are some disciplines, like engineering um, or others, where women are still not at parity. But for the most part, when it comes to degrees at every level, bachelor's degrees, master's, and PhDs, women are, um, are now equal or higher uh, than men. So that is enormous progress. And the, and the court never said that we shouldn't have gender balance in our campuses. But it has said we're not really looking for racial balance. And it's never been really challenged on that idea. Uh, because if you think about it, if if we if we truly don't have a myth of a racial democracy in in place, then you would think that there would be no barriers to access, and so that our campuses would reflect the, the population. But neither of them do, and so I think that we are actually struggling with much of the same phenomenon, which is not valuing blackness and overvaluing whiteness. Yeah, and so I truly appreciated the the earlier statement about this is uh, the 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 push for affirmative action is uh, the push against um, whiteness as the the standard of of excellence, and that's what I think we still see our institutions um, reflecting. Important. Yeah. Something. Alguém mais? No, no. No one wants to say anything else after you. <laughs> your last speech. Okay, is that? Is that the point? Podemos encerrar? Okay. Uh, so I want to, Professor, we want to say something else because we want to close because of the. I believe everyone is tired. Yes, no. <laughs> Not you, but. No. People here want to listen more, I believe, with more time. But Professor Dorn, no? Yeah. No, so I, the only thing I want to say is thank you very much. Uh, I so appreciated the invitation. We've had a wonderful time today listening to all of the speakers and, and being a part of this conversation. Um, and we look forward to more partnership with you in the future. Oh, I, I am happy. Okay, so thank you everyone to be here. Uh, muito obrigada para todas as pessoas por terem acompanhado esse dia intenso de de discussão. For having been with us in this intensive day of discussions and reflections, we unfortunately cannot spend more time with the discussions. We believe that we can uh, have partnerships to keep on discussing these subjects. I want to thank once again the Institute of Advanced Studies for having hosted this important event in partnership with our N Peripherias, the group of uh, psychology of the ethnical social relations responsible for bringing these wonderful people to speak 
to discuss a subject that is basic for us. And thank you here. Also, a Professor Davis, Professor Dorn, Professor Maxine, Professor Thelma, and friend Cheryl to help us to receive us and organize this wonderful, wonderful meeting. And Professor Alessandro, of course, for organize uh, everything in advance, ok? Então é isso, gente, muito obrigada. Obrigada aos técnicos que ajudaram aqui a resolver as questões, o pessoal da casa que organizou também uh, as mensagens do YouTube e trouxe aqui para nós todo esse suporte para passarmos o dia juntos. Tá? Então é isso, gente, obrigada, até a próxima, tchau, tchau. Os tradutores, eu esqueci de agradecer sem vocês, nada teria acontecido. <risos> Tchau.